my hand here. I'm holding our fragile moment, how lessons from Earth's past can help us survive the climate crisis by our old buddy, Dr. Michael Mann, the distinguished professor and director of the Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media at the University of Pennsylvania, the author of numerous books, uh, most recently this, Our Fragile Moment. Uh, Michael Mann, a man with two N's, dot net is his website. His Twitter handle is Michael E. Mann. And uh, Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks, Tom. It's good to be with you again. It is always so nice to have you with us. I saw you on, uh, I think it was MSNBC. Was it this morning or last night? I'm, uh, yeah, it was uh, Morning Joe. I had yeah, some Morning there, there Joe with Morning Joe. Yeah, yeah. good. I'm, I'm so glad to see, you know, uh, high profile hits like that. That's, that's wonderful. So, uh, you know, let's, let's go through some of, and, and I understand we have, you know, roughly 25 minutes here to talk and, and uh, I'm grateful for you uh, for that. Um, uh, Antarctic sea ice in mind blowing low alarms experts. I'm seeing this headline, um, without ice cooling the planet, Antarctica could transform from Earth's refrigerator to a radiator. What, what is going on in the Arctic and Antarctic? Yeah, well, the Antarctic ice, uh, sea ice is sort of a complicated thing because, um, you know, in the Arctic, we have an ocean at the North Pole. In Antarctica, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a continent, Antarctica, at the pole. And so in that case, the, you know, the, the sea ice isn't really uh, Antarctic sea ice. It's sort of at the periphery of the continent of Antarctica. It's at a higher or a, rather a lower latitude. And it does funny things. Um, it, for a while, it was actually growing, even as the rest of the planet was warming up. Uh, Antarctic ice sheet, uh, uh, sea ice rather, was was growing, and that appeared to have more to do with increased humidity than anything else. And so, it's always been a sort of complicated thing. But make no mistake, we're seeing now retreat of Antarctic uh, sea ice. We're seeing retreat of Arctic sea ice. And it's part of a larger pattern of a, a warming planet, uh, a planet that continues to warm as we continue to pump carbon pollution into the atmosphere. I read somewhere that some, some months ago, <coughs> excuse me, that the last time CO2 levels, atmospheric CO2 levels were at or close to where they are right now, there were palm trees growing in Antarctica. Is that accurate? Um, I'm not sure if that is uh, accurate. Uh, it is certainly true that if you go back to, say, the Cretaceous period, uh, 100 million years ago, for example, uh, the Arctic and, and the Antarctic were both uh, unfrozen. There was no ice. Uh, and uh, there is evidence that there were palm trees in you know antarctica um it wasn't very much sunlight it was still dark for a large uh, part of the year uh, but it was very warm and so there are times in the distant past if you go far enough back in time when carbon dioxide levels were substantially higher than they are now and the planet was warmer and this is one of the things you often hear climate critics cite well it changes naturally there was a time when it was warmer than today so what's the the you know, the big problem today. And the, the problem today is that we are warming the planet at a rate that is unprecedented, that is much faster than any of these past natural warming events. And we have a population of more than 8 billion people dependent on infrastructure that was built around a stable climate, which is now changing substantially. Which, which raises my kind of follow-on question, which is if the last time CO2 levels were this high, uh, the Earth was a very different place, shall we say, whether or not there were palm yeah. trees in Antarctica. Um, where are we in, in that curve? I mean, it, it, it yeah. seems to me like where we are is we've hit the CO2 levels that are appropriate for a very different planet, right. but we haven't yet hit that very different planet yet, but it's coming. I mean, if we were to stop all fossil fuels today, we're at 1.5 degrees Celsius. What is that going to mean, even if we were to stop everything over the next couple of decades? Yeah, and this is one of the things that I uh, try to parse out in the book is, you know, um, how far back do you have to go, uh, you know, to find CO2 levels that were basically what they are today? And it turns out you probably have to go back about four uh, three and three and a half to four million years uh, ago uh, during 
the mid Pliocene, um, an, an era where there was no Greenland ice sheet. Um, so that's sort of worrying, right? Because uh, mm. if we lose the Greenland ice sheet, uh, you know, it's five meters, uh, potentially 15, 16 uh, feet of sea level rise right there. And, you know, if the reality is that the last time CO2 levels were as high as they are right now, about 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. There was no ice sheet and sea levels were, you know, meters higher than they are today. And the planet was actually warmer than it is today. Does that mean that we are already committed to that? That even if we stop burning fossil fuels, if we just let the climate catch up. Right. That's my question. We've already put in. Um, does that mean that we get you know, those meters of sea level rise, a, a much warmer planet. And it turns out there's a little bit of good news, which is the fact that the climate, climate change isn't simply a function of, say, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It depends on where you're coming from. And back then, we were coming from a warm climate and getting cooler. Right now, we're coming from a cool climate and getting warmer. We're going in the opposite direction. And that may buy us a little bit of a margin, but not much of a margin. So if you look at the collective evidence, it means if we were the planet, say another uh, one degree Fahrenheit or, or more than that, that could put us over that threshold where we basically get the conditions that existed uh, during the mid Pliocene. And, and massive sea level rise and all of the impacts that come with it. So it again speaks to how fragile this moment really is, which is of course the title of the book. You know, I, uh, my apologies, I haven't had an opportunity to, to read every word of your book yet. I've, I've no spent a little time with it, but we just got it. Um, uh, but I noticed that, you know, in, in the early chapter, you've got, you have the, uh, the great conveyor belt, this, this uh, uh, warm water current that flows from the, the South Pacific under the, under the yep. tip of South Africa, uh, up through along the uh, east coast of the, of the Americas and out into the Atlantic uh, and, you know, settles again off the coast of England, more or less, or south of yep. Greenland. And then, you know, re, re, and, and, and it brings enough heat to Europe that Europe can grow crops year round. And I mean, at the latitude of Calgary, you know. Um, right. Yeah. We've talked, you and I have talked about this numerous times over the years. I'm wondering what your latest thinking is on the fate and future of the Great Conveyor Belt, because if that thing fails, are we not looking at the possibility of mass famine, uh, particularly in Europe, but all over the world? Yeah, you know, and, and again, it's a good example of um, looking to the past, which is what I do in this book, teaches us lessons about our potential future. And we know that this current system did collapse at the end of the last ice age, uh, about 12,000 years ago, as all that melt water from the melting ice sheets flooded the North Atlantic, freshened those waters, inhibited, inhibited the sinking motion that sort of drives that, that global ocean conveyor, uh, cooling off large parts of the North Atlantic, neighboring regions of North America and, and Europe. So we know it happened. And we know that we're melting ice now, uh, the Greenland ice sheet in particular, uh, we're seeing massive amounts of uh, surface melt now from the Greenland ice sheet and that water's running off into the North Atlantic. And here's the thing, Tom, this is happening sooner than expected. The critics love to cite uncertainty. I know we've talked about this before. They love to cite uncertainty as a reason for inaction. But uncertainty isn't helping. It's, it's hurting. It's breaking not in our favor, but against us. We're learning as we learn more, as we understand more of the intricacies of the climate system, as we bring in more observations of what's actually happening. We're seeing that some of these impacts are playing out faster than our models predicted. And one of them is the slowing of this ocean conveyor. It's actually happening earlier than we expected. This probably because the you know, Greenland ice sheet is producing more of that meltwater earlier than we expected. And here's the good news is what will happen won't look like the, the movie The Day After Tomorrow, which is a caricature of what would happen if the ocean conveyor collapsed. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is really bad things would likely happen. We'd get faster sea level rise along the east coast of the U.S., maybe an extra foot from the collapse of this ocean current system. And that just has to do with oceanographic physics that I'm not gonna get into. Um, and it also means that we could see a collapse, as you alluded to, of uh, marine productivity and fish populations. The North Atlantic is one of the great nat uh, natural fisheries of the world. And if this ocean 
uh, you know, pattern, if this ocean circulation pattern collapses, it, it turns out that that means there are less nutrients that are brought to the surface waters of the North Atlantic, and we could see uh, dire impacts on fish populations, which obviously impacts us because 25% of uh, the, you know, the, the people on this planet, seafood is their primary source of protein. And so, yeah, a lot of bad things would happen, and some of these things are happening faster. Uh, the planet is warming at about the rate that the models predicted. The models have been good about that. But some of the impacts, melting ice, sea level rise, the collapsing conveyor, the extreme weather events that we are now seeing so regularly, um, some of these impacts are playing out earlier and faster. And that's one of the themes in this book. Uncertainty is not our friend. We, 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 when we look to the past, for lessons, that's one of the lessons that we learned. I also wanted to uh, let you know, uh, particularly those of you who ever called, who have called into our program in what the last what four or five years, Sean, is how long Joyce worked with us. Joyce Nance, her last name is N A N C E. Uh, Joyce uh, also, and I, I don't think I've ever, I, I think I have mentioned it on the air a couple of times. But Joyce is also an author. If you go over to Amazon and plug her name in, uh, Joyce N A N C E, you'll find several of her books over there. Uh, she writes uh, thrillers, murder mysteries. Um, but uh, she, she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic lung cancer that has already spread into her bones. Um, when she quit her job here, we thought she just needed a chiropractor. And we learned several days later how, how bad this diagnosis was. And uh, her family, her daughter has put a GoFundMe page up to help her pay her bills. Um, I made a donation last night uh, so the, the easy way to find it is just to go to GoFundMe.com, and there's a little search button up at the top, and click on that search button and type in Joyce Nance, N-A-N-C-E, and you'll get her GoFundMe page. I mean, it's terrible that we live in a country where people have to put up GoFundMe pages when they get sick, uh, you know, to pay all the bills and whatnot, and Joyce and her wife, Gail, are, are no doubt you know, having a really, really tough time now. She's started uh, radiation and chemotherapy, and uh, this is going to be tough. This is going to be a real battle for her. And the odds are stacked against her, and, you know, we all need to help however we can. So uh, if you have any sort of particular affection for Joyce, uh, Joyce Nance, N-A-N-C-E, uh, over on GoFundMe, uh, we'll get you there. And uh, let's see if we can get, you know, those contributions up a little bit to help her out.